Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, it's wonderful to be in Canning. Um, I spent the whole day here. I, uh, Mike gave me a fantastic tour of the uh, whole city uh, and we just saw the diversity of the people, of the different housing types here. I uh, had great sessions today with a lot of top leadership from the city and, and really understood that their desire to make this an even better city and, and engage better with the community. I uh, got to have lunch with the mayor uh, and then, uh, then I did this incredible walk out here and uh, walked along through the wetlands that have been created and along the river. And I tell you, I was on the Great Ocean Road on uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I was in Rat's Nest yesterday. Rot Nest and Rot, rot Nest. Yeah, I, I picked it up. So, but I, I've never seen such a high concentration of uh, different kinds of birds in one place. Half hour walk. I just saw incredible bird life. So it's it's a, it's wonderful to be here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Seattle. How many of you been to Seattle? All right. Oh, that's good. Much higher percentage than this morning. That's good. That's good. <laughs> So um, this is the image a lot of people have in Seattle. This is our Space Needle, Mount Rainier. We're surrounded by mountains, surrounded by water. And a lot of people know Seattle. Oh, I've got to turn this on, I guess. A lot of people know Seattle from, um, uh, from the Pike Place Market. Uh, some of you may know about the tossing of the salmon that they do. Um, Seattle is the home of the world's first Starbucks. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> home of Bill Gates and Microsoft. It's where they build the Boeing airplanes. But what most people don't see about Seattle is what I really love, which is our strong neighborhoods. We have over 100 neighborhoods. Our hills, our valleys, our water help to define distinct places. Each place tends to have its own business district, its own neighborhood associations. So there's a real strong sense of place in Seattle. People identify with their neighborhood, whether it's Alki or Columbia City or Capitol Hill. Uh, and our neighborhoods, this is the first neighborhood I lived in, the Wallingford neighborhood, where they're so proud, they put the name of the neighborhood in neon lights at the top of the grocery store. And a lot of our neighborhoods are defined by the unique character. This is our historic Pioneer Square neighborhood. And this is the Floating Homes Association, the, the, the neighborhood of Floating Homes, where they sleep with in Seattle. That's another neighborhood. And a lot of our neighborhoods are defined by their housing stock. So this is a typical little uh, bungalow in one of our neighborhoods in Ballard. This particular house was uh, lived in by a woman who was 85 years old. She lived in this house for most of her life. A developer owned the property on either side of her house wanted, and wanted to tear down her house so he could put in a large mixed-use development. So he offered to buy her house and she said, I'm not selling. He offered her one million dollars. Her house is worth about $150,000. Just a little house and a little lot. She said, I'm still not selling. My community is worth more to me than $1 million. She was a hero in her neighborhood. The developer responded. And to me, this is kind of a symbol of what's happening, the way people are experiencing community in so many places, where decisions are being made that they have no control over, the decisions being made by outside money or by outside powers. And people also, so many people feeling isolated in their communities. Even if there's a strong sense of community, there's so many individuals who don't feel a part of community. So this was part of a development pattern that was really uh, kicking off in Seattle in the late 1980s, where more and more people were coming to Seattle to enjoy our wonderful natural environment, and the process totally screwing it up. And uh, we're changing the character of our neighborhoods that people prize so much, getting increasing parking issues, traffic issues, increased issues around drugs and gangs and violence, and people were blaming City Hall. In fact, I was one of the chief organizers. Here's a demonstration I organized. Uh, where we were fighting a big box retail uh, proposal that was threatening the Little Saigon neighborhood. So we had hundreds of people marching down the streets with big boxes around their shoulders. And this kind of uh, neighborhood groups all over Seattle are becoming increasingly active and reactive really to City Hall and blaming City Hall for all the problems in the neighborhoods. In the Fremont neighborhood, they were so angry that they simply erected a rocket on the side of one of their businesses and they announced that it was aimed at City Hall. Uh, they declared themselves the Artist Republic of Fremont. They started issuing their own postage stamps. Um, and this kind of activity is going all over, on all over the place. So finally, our city council, some members were just concerned about their future jobs. And some, were some said, you know, there's got to be a better way to run a democracy. 
when people start being so, uh, feeling so alienated from government that they're erecting rockets, something's wrong. We've got to do things in a different way. So in 1988, our city established a first ever Department of Neighborhoods. First time a department had been organized the way the community was organized, by place, rather than by discrete functions. And I got surprised my life, because the mayor at the time, Charlie Royer, called me and said, Jim, I'd like to appoint you to be the director of this office. Well, the reason I was surprised is that I only had two contacts with Charlie prior to that time. One was when we had picketed his house, <laughs> and the other was when we released a live chicken in his office because he backed down to campaign commitments. So we called him Chicken Charlie. I'm not trying to give you any ideas. <laughs> yeah. But what I, so I'm still not sure why I got that appointment. It may have just been trying to get me off the streets, or it may have been payback because it was a pretty controversial office when it started. But what I realized was I was not going to keep that job for very long if I just trained people how to release chickens in the mayor's office, right? <laughs> I would need to find a new way of engaging people with City Hall and a, and a new way to engage City Hall with the people. And so what we, what we worked towards was how do we create more of a real partnership? And what we realized very quickly was that in order to move towards a partnership, it took a huge paradigm shift, not only in the part of City Hall, but also on the part of the community. That we had to act in very different ways. So I put together this chart to showing some of the changes that need to be made. And I'm not going to go through and read all this. You can do it yourself. Uh, but just to highlight a couple of the things, um, government needs to shift by moving beyond customer service and citizen participation to community empowerment. The community, for its part, needs to think and act as citizens rather than just thinking of themselves as ratepayers. So the point is, if, if government is just treating people as customers, and it's important to provide good customer service, and I know that's a real focus of the city and it's very important, but if all we do is treat people as customers, the inverse relationship is to think of yourself only as a ratepayer. So it's how do we get people to start thinking of themselves as citizens again and start seeing government as an extension of ourselves. Uh, when I met with the mayor this noon, he really gets it. He kept talking about the importance of ownership. That's what it's all about. So other major changes that need to be made are uh, that the community can't partner with government the way government's currently organized, where every function is organized into its own silo, where everybody's trying to reach out to the community as individual departments or individual functions. It only works if government is working as a whole, is working across all those silos and takes more of a place-based approach. And in the same way, government can't partner with the community when the community is divided into all kinds of factions, when different community interests are fighting with each other and not talking to each other, when business and residents and homeowners and tenants and young people and seniors are all in their own silos and not communicating with one another. So I'm not going to go through all those, but those are a few major changes. But the biggest change that needs to be made on the part of both government and community, if we're going to move towards partnership, is to stop focusing on this map that we tend to have of our neighborhoods. And our mental map of the neighborhoods in government and in our communities tends to be focusing on all the problems in our neighborhoods. This is a legitimate map. The purpose for government is to address needs that we can't address, uh, the communities can't address themselves. But if we stop here, we're only looking at half the glass. And frankly, we're looking at the useless part of the glass. You can't do anything with a half empty part of the glass. But that's usually all we focus on. Communities, for their part, tend to focus on the half empty part as well. And always look to government for all the, all the uh, resources, all the solutions. And forget that we have incredible capacity in our communities to do things for ourselves. It just shows the futility of looking, in the, you know, how ridiculous it is just to look at the half-empty part of the glass. So what's the basis for partnerships is to start to focus on the half-full part of the glass. And this is a map of exactly that same neighborhood, but instead of focusing on what's missing, we focus on what's there, on all the strengths of the community, on the gifts of individuals in the community, on the many, many, there's hundreds of voluntary associations, different networks in every neighborhood. The built and natural environment, particularly those underutilized resources, the local economy, the local heritage and identity, and the local agencies are all underutilized resources in our communities. Probably the, the one that gets the most overlooked is the fact that every individual 
Everybody living in our communities, everybody, without exception, has incredible gifts to give. Everybody's got gifts of the head, their unique knowledge. Everybody's got gifts of the heart, their passions. And everybody's got gifts of the hands, their unique skills. The problem in our society is that we're increasingly putting labels on huge sections of our community that label them not by their strengths, but by their deficiencies. So I'm sure you recognize some of these labels we put on people. Homeless, unemployed, poor, non-English speaking, single parent, addict, sex worker, at-risk youth, old person. Boy, I get increasingly sensitive to that one. <laughs> um, and disabled. And when we put those labels on, it defines people solely in terms of what they're missing. And everybody in this room, everybody in our communities, has needs, but everybody also has incredible gifts to give. And somehow in our society, we've created two classes of people. We've created the class of people with the labels and the needs, and we've created the class of people with all the gifts. And when we just focus on people's needs, they become clients in a service system. And when we focus on people's gifts, they become citizens in our community. So we need to lift those labels off. So one of the first things we did in the Department of Neighborhoods was try to figure out how do we get our neighborhood associations to be more inclusive? Because our organizations tended to be whiter, more middle class, more homeowners, more middle aged than the neighborhood as a whole. So we tried to help groups think about how they could be so much stronger if they removed those labels and focused on everybody's gifts. So we started with the people who are the most, the most isolated in our neighborhoods. Those people who are living in group homes for years outside of our neighborhoods, who are being increasingly deinstitutionalized, living in our neighborhoods, people with developmental disabilities, who are part of a service system, living in our neighborhoods, but not part of our community life. So we started a program we called Involving All Neighbors. And the idea was to focus on the gifts of people with developmental disabilities. So one of the first people who came to see me was Matt. Matt and his mom came to see me. Matt says, I've been living in the Ravenna neighborhood for eight years. I don't know anybody. I'm totally alone. I said, Matt, what do you like? And he took me to Ravenna Creek. He says, I love this creek. I knew the neighborhood association was working to clean up that creek to make a better salmon habitat. So I talked to the neighborhood leader, to Thomas, and I said, Thomas, could you involve Matt in the project? He said, sure, we can always use more volunteers. So they trained Matt how to remove the invasive plants, how to reforest with native plants. And soon, Matt became the expert. And Matt was leading work parties. Here he is, teaching other people how to remove the invasive holly from along the creek. But Matt's greatest gift, he's got this incredibly infectious personality. So he comes in, he knocks on your door, and he says, hi, I'm Matt. I really care about the salmon, don't you? You'll help me, won't you? I mean, you can't say no to the guy. So he's got armies of people cleaning up the, cleaning up the invasive plants from along the creek. And he's incredibly creative. So you see all this invasive holly. At Christmas time, he organizes a holly day party. And all the neighbors go and they collect this invasive holly, they make Christmas decorations, and they go back to Matt's house afterwards and have a big party. And Matt is totally socially uninhibited. He's always the first one out to dance floor. And he helps everybody else break out of their shells. That's his gift. But it was being lost under that label of developmentally disabled. 